Hello, everyone, and welcome to Training Deep Learning Models in the Cloud, brought to you by the SNEA Cloud Storage Technologies Initiative. I'm Erin Farr, your moderator for today's discussion. And I work for IBM, and I serve as Vice Chair of SNEA Cloud Storage Technologies Initiative. And today we have two excellent speakers. We have Malin Pundit, Senior Solutions Architect at Habana Labs, an Intel company. Hello, Malin. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks. And we have Silam, who just goes by Silam, a principal research scientist at IBM. How are you, Silam? I'm doing very well. And thanks, everyone, for listening to our talk. Thanks. And so first, a little bit about SNEA. The Storage Network Industry Association is a group of about 180 leading industry-leading organizations comprising of 2,500 active contributing members and 50,000 participating IT end users and storage experts worldwide. And... For those who aren't familiar, SNEA is a global not-for-profit association dedicated to advancing the adoption of technologies related to storage. We also provide an extensive range of educational materials, um, which can all be found in the SNEA Educational Library. And just some logistics for today, you can ask questions during the presentation by selecting the Ask Question option and entering your question. And the slides are available at the attachment tab at the bottom of your console. And the last thing before we get started is let's take a quick look at the SNEA legal notice. This provides SNEA's copyright notice regarding use of the material. SNEA is not providing any legal advice and there are no warranties expressed or implied. So if you want to reference this material, please do so at your own risk. And so with that, uh, welcome everyone to today's session on deep learning. Deep learning is a rapidly growing field in artificial intelligence that has revolutionized the way we approach problems in various domains, including image and speech recognition, natural language processing, and robotics. And with the rise of deep learning, we are seeing breakthroughs in applications such as self-driving cars, virtual assistants, and personalized medicine. In fact, ChatGPT, a tool utilizing deep learning, actually created the introduction that I just read. So if that doesn't spark your interest, I'm sure these topics from our speakers will. Today we will cover industry trends in AI, examples of AI adoption and benefits, and considerations for adopting AI technologies, including scale out infrastructure, unified platform for training and inference, and middleware stack and tools. And with that, I will turn it over to Melind. Thank you, Erin. Um, I want to start by looking at some industry trends related to AI. I'm so glad you mentioned that GPT because in recent weeks, there's been tremendous public excitement the world over about chat GPT. Uh, it's disrupting education, uh, software development, and of course, internet search. Uh, and just before chat GPT, we saw excitement about stable diffusion and DALL-E, uh, where AI is creating stunning images at dramatic speeds, but this is raising concerns about ownership and copyright. These technologies are examples of deep neural networks. We've known for a few years that training deep neural network models and employing them to work for us is going to consume increasing amounts of infrastructure in the world's data centers. This report predicts that a third of servers shipped in 2026 are going to be running deep learning training or inference. And training applications are expected to be the majority of server applications by that year. This study indicates that over a quarter of organizations plan to train and retrain deep neural network models daily or even hourly. This puts a huge demand on the storage infrastructure as well as the compute infrastructure in any data center. Uh, speaking of compute, this chart indicates growing demand for computation over a 60 year period. Uh, it's not surprising that the trend of this chart indicates exponential growth in this demand. What's not obvious is that the y-axis is actually logarithmic. So this chart is showing exponential upon exponential growth in the demand for computation. Now, before 2010, the demand was doubling approximately every 20 months. 
when deep neural networks became popular between 2010 and 2016, the demand surged to double every six months. And recently it's been doubling every 10 months. Uh, by way of introduction, I'm part of Habana. Habana was a fabulous semiconductor startup that was acquired by Intel in 2019. Its focus was on producing chips named Gaudi that accelerate training and inference precisely to meet this growing demand. Next, let's look at some specific examples of adoption of AI by enterprises. Uh, Selim? Yep, uh, thank you, Milan. Um, so, of course, many of you know, <laughs> probably played with ChatGPT, and ChatGPT is a technology for language domains. And while we think there is a big um, business opportunity on the language side, from an IBM perspective, we think actually the opportunity is goes beyond languages. And as Greg mentioned in that tweet at the bottom, other modalities uh, we think play an increasingly important role, uh, either it's in chemistry and materials where scientists are to, uh, trying to create new materials, digital interactions like chatbots that have proliferated a lot uh, based with AI technology during the COVID time. Um, we uh, announced uh, uh, some help around programming languages uh, so called Project Wisdom, where AI de developers in general will become highly efficient by using AI as an augmentation tool uh, as they either write new code or debug existing uh, code uh, in a more, far more productive way. Um, same thing applies in tabular data, which is quite uh, rich in enterprise space and also uh, sensor data uh, that's actually increasingly uh, becoming available uh, with more and more connected uh, cars and devices and so on. So um, our interest and our work has been actually how to bring these AI technologies that are primarily uh, maturing in the language space to these many other modalities uh, where uh, enterprises are actually um, uh, flooded with the data from these uh, um, uh, interactions. Go ahead, Milan. I think you have more examples. Thank you, Selim. Thank you. Uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about adoption of AI by Lidos. Lidos is a Habana customer that provides services to the U.S. Veterans Administration. So in one AI application, they trained a model to detect and localize multiple diseases from chest X-ray images. And then they fine tuned the training of this model to detect the presence of COVID pneumonia specifically. So this automated system promised to rapidly identify urgent medical needs uh, during the pandemic. Uh, in a second application, they fine tuned the training of a language model on 900,000 examples to label medical benefit applications. So the model could determine automatically whether a medical benefit should be approved, uh, maybe rejected, or maybe held until more information was gathered. Uh, the, the point was that it reduced time, labor, and human error in the processing of applications. You can read the details uh, of this uh, work on this web page. Uh, Mobileye is an Intel customer that provides solutions for autonomous vehicles. They've been using Habana Gaudi chips to rapidly train computer vision models. So by choosing their infrastructure carefully, they've enjoyed cost savings as well as faster time to market with these solutions. Sorry, I'm getting a bit of lag here and I'm jumping ahead. Okay. All right. Are 
for you. Do you guys hear me? Um, no, I'm 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 getting a lot of lag in loading the slides. Hold on. There we go. Okay. Uh, Northwestern Medicine is another Habana customer that's developing an automated system to analyze and report on medical images. So they'll take a medical image and generate a report in the same writing style as a particular radiologist. Uh, again, their automated system is going to speed the diagnosis and treatment of a variety of illnesses. They selected their infrastructure on the basis of ease of use uh, because they had physicians who may not have had a ton of data science expertise. Uh, and of course, uh, stable diffusion. At a conference last September, Intel demonstrated the use of uh, Habana Gaudi chips for image generation. So they typed a prompt which said superhero movie poster with a female and male in the style of Art Deco. And within a few seconds, the model had generated 16 high resolution images matching the prompt. This not only made for an impressive demo, but the enterprise customers began to approach us because drafting creative images is a critical part of their own marketing processes. Now, the attraction and benefits of deep learning models are becoming more obvious to everyone, uh, thanks to the excitement around chat GPT and, and other advances like the ones we just discussed. But there are other important considerations to make before adopting AI technologies. And an important one is the need to scale out storage as well as compute. Uh, for example, San Diego Supercomputer deployed a cluster with 336 accelerators, and they make this available for a variety of research projects in medicine, metallurgy, and even cosmology. We recently configured a cluster with 512 accelerators. It has two levels of networking, and it's large enough to train and fine tune models that are at the scale of GPT-3. Philem? Yeah, th yep, th thank you, Belen. And, and we have seen this trend to train bigger and bigger AI models uh, at IBM and IBM research in particular. And we have been on a path to build multiple generations of large scale uh, systems and I'll talk about the system architecture we have just uh, announced um, recently, but this system has been operational since May. And what I want to take, um, uh, or what I want you to take from this is uh, take this as a kind of a reference architecture that you might be able to leverage in your own data centers as you start to consider deploying these kinds of AI systems. So the Vela system that we deployed is in IBM Cloud. Um, the system consists of thousands of uh, NVIDIA A100 GPUs. The building block of the system is an 8-GPU uh, NVIDIA HGX uh, system that has both NVLink and NVSwitch connectivity. Uh, each node has uh, dual socket Cascade Lake CPUs with sufficient enough memory to, to be able to train really large, memories, uh, large memory models. Um, so we put about 1.5 terabytes of uh, DRAM and also the system has significant storage. So we deployed actually about 12 terabytes of NVMe storage to be on the nodes. So that as you are training these models, the data that's needed to feed these models actually can be cached on the nodes themselves. So you don't have to go over the network to get the, the data to the compute elements. Uh, the system has, a, uh, as Milind mentioned in the previous slide, is a very similar architecture. We have a two level class topology uh, so there is top of rack switches and spine switches, and we have redundant connections going from nodes to tors and tors to spines, uh, and it's deployed with uh, 200 gigabits of uh, networking from each node. This is a slight departure from typically what you see uh, reference designs from uh, vendors. Uh, sometimes they recommend you use 800 gigabits uh, or 1.6 terabits of uh, bandwidth. We have done extensive experimentation and found that a lot of the AI workloads uh, that we train do not need the large amount of uh, network bandwidth that uh, the vendors might prescribe. 
So you should really look at the workloads uh, of interest to you and see what kind of uh, networking infrastructure is necessary. But this was this is necessary. Uh, this is sufficient for our uh, use cases. The other thing we have done is we put this actually part of uh, the IBM public cloud. So that means we can configure all of the resources through software. And this has become a significant differentiator for, for us because we use the same system to uh, train a lot of our research models. But at the same time, we collaborate with our partners in the community, like PyTorch community. Uh, and recently, we made an announcement about NASA, uh, for example. So when we have these kinds of engagements, this allows us to actually partition the system in a uh, secure manner and bring in uh, clients and uh, partners to uh, train more, jointly train models. Uh, I call AI, training an AI model is uh, more like a team sport rather than an individual sport. You need to bring in uh, the people with the data. You need to bring in the expertise uh, from, from your side. And you uh, sometimes need help from communities like uh, PyTorch and others. So we use this to collaborate uh, with the uh, various customers. Um, the other piece is we, while this is actually a cloud system, it is uh, designed such that we can deliver really near bare metal performance. And I'll say a few words about that uh, in the next slide. Um, so this is a little bit more zoomed in architecture of the node. Uh, and you will see these kind of nodes actually uh, broadly available in other cloud providers as well. So it's kind of a reference design uh, from a node perspective. What you are seeing here is eight accelerators or eight GPUs in this particular case, but others have uh, accelerators, typically uh, eight on a single system connected over a um, proprietary fabric, which is called NV uh, switch fabric at the bottom. And those accelerators are typically connected to CPU through multiple layers of PCI switching. And in a number of cases, the network cards actually sweep, uh, run off of those PCI switches. So we could do TCP-based communication, Rocky, and also GDR or GPU direct RDMA, which enables uh, GPUs to talk to each other uh, while they are in different uh, different systems. Um, a layer of virtualization is what abstracts all this complexity. So we actually expose all of these capabilities through a VM, uh, and then VM becomes the deployment uh, unit from an end user perspective. We use a uh, standard Linux uh, hypervisor uh, from Ubuntu, uh, and we have done a lot of work to actually ensure that the hypervisor does not um, add any overhead uh, for any of the execution. So a lot of the work went into exposing the capabilities of the node, the PCI topology, uh, setting up the node for virtualization so that within the VM, what you are getting is actually close to uh, what you should expect from a bare metal perspective. So what I show in the next slide is actually just some numbers uh, from a uh, communication perspective. So one NIC is one network interface. We use one, two, four, and eight network interfaces from a single node and across different protocols. So the top part shows if you just take the standard out-of-the-box hypervisor and deploy it with the, uh, either bare metal, in which case you're not using the hypervisor, you don't create a VM, or in a VM, the open source uh, virtualization technology still has some gaps. And as a result, your bandwidth performance is actually suffer significantly. But uh, a lot of the enhancements we made and we contributed them back to the community, you can actually get close to uh, bare metal performance uh, in, in many scenarios. In, in, in fact, in some scenarios, the VMs actually perform slightly better than the bare metal because inside the VM, we enable uh, large bases at the host level. So there are some small optimizations that go in uh, that help, but this is mostly noise. So you can, you can kind of get this kind of performance while also getting all of the flexibility uh, as a virtual machine. And we have a detailed talk at GTC 2021 uh, about this particular topic, if there is interest. Uh, that, that, those are the set of considerations around how you pick your scale out infrastructure, how you architect a system and how you deploy it. Now we will get into considerations for uh, adoption of these technologies with the uh, platform uh, for training and inference. Milind, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Selim. I was gonna say uh, you had started talking about the software platform. Um, another important consideration is the ecosystem around that software infrastructure. Uh, it's very important that your software infrastructure integrate with the ecosystem for training and inference. Uh, various organizations like the ones represented here, uh, they provide open source models, 
libraries to facilitate and scale training. Uh, they provide cluster management infrastructure and they provide uh, machine learning operations platforms, MLOps platforms. If your infrastructure ends up being incompatible with this ecosystem, then adoption is definitely going to be a challenge. Yep, absolutely. Um, I second that and I, I will add a few more uh, points to that uh, point and that is uh, within you know uh, IBM and many organizations, you have basically two paths. You want to train these models, but the real value of these models come from uh, when you deploy them into production, right? And today, uh, in a lot of the use cases, typically this training and deployment happen in two different platforms, in two different environments, in two different infrastructures. And that difference in those environments causes huge friction. Uh, I heard of stories where people take up to six months to take a trained model and deploy it into production. That's just an enormous amount of time in which time the models, the technology is actually rapidly changing. So uh, to solve this problem, we have uh, started to talk about um, a hybrid cloud platform based purely off of containers and Kubernetes. Um, many of you probably know uh, Kubernetes is a container um, orchestration mechanism and we standardize all of our both training, fine tuning, uh, actually all of all phases of training, which includes uh, uh, data pre-processing, uh, uh, training, fine tuning, and inference, all on Kubernetes. But the challenge with Kubernetes is um, typically this kind of training infra infrastructure is managed through HPC or high performance computing schedulers and um, uh, resource management layers like uh, Slurm, LSF, and so on. Um, and while and Kubernetes is actually built for more web applications, right? It's just very popular in you know uh, running websites and things like that. Now, when you try to run these kinds of HPC application types on high performance infrastructure with Kubernetes, you will identify a number of gaps. And so we have been working with the Kubernetes community um, for the last several years, actually, to close these gaps to bring Kubernetes to more HPC uh, centric workloads so that we can also do the training. And once the train model is complete, then you can actually take it and deploy it for inference. And that time uh, of, of six months can be really brought down to a substantially smaller amount within days and weeks. So, uh, so I listed here some gaps in Kubernetes and that uh, some of them we are trying to fill. And I'll be interested in actually hearing from the community on additional gaps that you might be seeing uh, that, that we should be addressing. So one of the gaps that we see in the Kubernetes community with um, uh, AI training is the job management and queuing. AI resources are finite. So that means there is never enough resource to run all the AI models people want to train. So there is always a queue of jobs waiting. And these are not simple queues. Uh, there are always people that have higher priority than others. There is always business uh, requirements that a particular task uh, training job finishes earlier than others. Um, there are requirements like a particular training should start by some amount of time and, and a certain number of resources should be given. So it's a fairly complex queuing and job management system that's required and Kubernetes sorely lacks that. This kind of system exists in traditional HPC, so we are trying to bring uh, those capabilities, but also and bring it such that it's actually more suitable for this more containerized uh, cloud native world. So over the years, we have built uh, something called MCAD, uh, our multi-cloud uh, app dispatcher. This is an open source project that's actually available in the community, and it's been um, uh, in various discussions with the Kubernetes uh, uh, ecosystem as well. Uh, what this brings is actually the, precisely this function of being able to queue many AI training jobs, um, prioritize them, preempt jobs if necessary for low priority jobs, for high priority jobs, but at the same time ensure there is no starvation. So that means your job actually runs within some amount of time and the resources are allocated in a more of a gang scheduling way. So that functionality is being built. And so this is one of the areas where uh, Kubernetes is maturing. Another one is more actually specific to like public cloud deployments where, as I mentioned, you know, if you are going to 
uh, uh, lease resources, GPU nodes from a cloud provider, and you don't have enough jobs to either uh, keep them busy, or you have jobs where you need actually 10 times more capacity, you want your cluster manager to auto scale. So, you, because if you keep those resources and not use them, that's expensive. But at the same time, when you need them, you need to be able to have the scheduler um, and resource manager to auto scale to get more resources and release resources when they are not being used. So that's what the Insta scale um, uh, part of the system uh, does. Um, and the final one uh, I have here, and there are a few others as well, but I'll just uh, pause with this, and that's the advanced network configurations. So as you might imagine, these kinds of GPU nodes typically come with high bandwidth networking, uh, InfiniBand, Ethernet, but 100 gigabit Ethernet. And in uh, many scenarios, the nodes I mentioned uh, come with eight 100 gigabits or four 100 gigabits or two 100 gigabits of networking. So when you have multiple network interfaces, Kubernetes by default does not expose those interfaces into the uh, pod. So that, that means your AI training job will not be able to leverage the networking that's available at the host level. So we built uh, a CNI uh, um, recently that exposes multiple network interfaces into the VM. And just to give a little bit more context, I use this uh, uh, as an example. So if you go to any public cloud, typically you find three types of network interfaces. Uh, one is called a common VPC network. So these are 10 or 15 or 25, 30 gigabit uh, Ethernet interfaces that your application can consume. And depending on which cloud provider, they may be 10, 20, 30 microseconds and, and typically 10 gig, tens of gigabits, and that can be exposed into your VM. There is a second network interface that uh, that is more close to the hardware is uh, single root IO virtualization based uh, uh, virtual functions. So this is where a network card can be uh, uh, virtualized into multiple virtual functions and those virtual functions can be directly exposed into the VM. So you are not doing any encapsulation or any management on the host side. Uh, and so the, the guest can get actually the full bandwidth. And th those can be exposed uh, up to 200 gigabits or 100 gigabit, uh, and you can achieve a smaller latency because you have only have a single TCP stack that's actually inside your VM. And the third interface uh, is Rocky or RDMA or converged Ethernet. So this is, again, still a SRIO-based virtual function. But within the uh, guest uh, operating system, you are actually bypassing all of your TCP stack and you are directly communicating uh, uh, through the virtual function uh, to the outside world. So you're able to perform basically RDMA operations. That further cuts down the latency uh, and keeps your throughput. This all works fine if you are just running in a virtual machine. And, and this is fully supported. But when we talk about uh, running containers, either in bare metal or virtual machines, this is actually where uh, the, the containers um, uh, will have a problem. In the uh, normal way of deploying, when you deploy containers like Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes pods usually have some kind of an encapsulation that happens with the uh, network, uh, uh, software-defined software networking of the container. So if you deploy OpenShift, it's called OpenShift SDN. And what that encapsulation does is actually every packet that's going in and out gets encapsulated. So it actually cuts down uh, almost as a 2x impact on both latency and throughput. So this SRIO, uh, this Linux CNI that we just uh, uh, built, oops, sorry, there is some kind of a echo. No? OK, now it's good, better. All right, so the, the Multinix CNI we built basically manages um, a, a uh, L3 IPv LAN network. And so it actually creates the, the exposes the VNICs directly into the VM, uh, into the pod. And so the pod is actually communicating at uh, line rate. And then the IP allocation, the allocation IP uh, management is all done um, uh, with this uh, uh, L3 VLAN. So that way you can communicate across nodes and across pods, but without incurring the overhead of the uh, encapsulation. And here is an example uh, uh, data for the kind of benefit you will get uh, when you adopt container technologies, but also use this kind of multi-NIC um, uh, CNIs. Uh, Left-hand side shows the network latency, so this is a half network latency. It's almost a, a factor of uh, 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 2x uh, because we eliminate complete encapsulation. And on the bandwidth side, it's a much higher um, uh, number than actually 2x. So if you 
uh, when you encapsulate these packets, uh, you will be bottlenecked by the speed of your processor. So you typically get about 30 gigabits per second on a 100 gigabit line. Uh, whereas when you remove that encapsulation, you can get close to the line rate of 100 gigabits. So that's a factor of three. And then when you have multiple network interfaces um, in the in the other scenario, you cannot even see the second interface. But once you have the multi nic kind of uh, uh, exposure, you will be able to see both interfaces and I'll use them at full bandwidth. So that's how you get a, a much bigger uh, bandwidth advantage as well. These all just to go go to show that if you you know adopt by adopting containers and by kind of enhancing these kind of kind of container interfaces, you will be able to run. AI training jobs at full bandwidth, at full speed, but also while getting the flexibility of a, a container platform that you can use to train as well as uh, immediately turn those models into uh, inference and fine tuning uh, tasks as well. With that, I will uh, turn over to Molind and uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about the uh, middleware stack and tools necessary uh, as you embark on this journey. Thank you, Salem. Uh, uh, yes, indeed. Another consideration when choosing your infrastructure is the middleware stack tools and resources. Uh, ultimately, data scientists might build new models on your infrastructure, but more likely they're going to migrate models that were previously built on other infrastructures. So your chosen infrastructure has to be supportive of this migration. Uh, most of the time, data scientists are accustomed to writing uh, scripts using the TensorFlow or PyTorch frameworks. They don't want to have to rewrite their scripts, and certainly not, they don't want to have to rewrite their algorithms it, just in order to accommodate some new infrastructure. They expect online documentation. They expect to get help from online forums. And if these resources are not available, then adoption is going to be an even bigger challenge. Elam? Yep. Uh, sorry, I was just looking at the chat. Um, let me just. Uh, in, in addition to um, just the developer tooling, another key piece that is required for distributed training is um, the uh, software uh, that, that you want to use, either it's uh, TensorFlow, PyTorch, and so on and so forth. And as the models get larger and larger, you need to uh, look for um, distributed mechanisms that enable you to use distributed um, uh, GPUs on, on AI accelerators on multiple nodes. Here I am giving just an example of of uh, two types of distributed training that we actually use quite extensively. The left-hand side, I'm showing something called distributed data parallel training, or DDP. Um, DDP is a model where your model actually fits uh, within the GPU. So if you are training with the hundreds of millions of parameter models and with increasing size of the GPU memory, some of these models fit quite nicely. So every GPU has a copy of the model. And what's given is a different bits of input data and then the model is crunching uh, on that data. And the model crunching on the data happens in two phases. The first phase is called a forward pass. So this is the time where you are actually computing through your network and you're computing um, uh, the, uh, uh, the new weights. And then once the forward pass completes, that's when you actually um, uh, figure out how, how far you are from the actual result you are supposed to be expecting and then you adjust back uh, you in a back propagation. Um, following these two steps in the backward compute phase, you need one critical step, which is uh, um, synchronizing all of the weights uh, that you have updated so that by the end of the uh, back prop stage, all the GPUs has exactly the same set of weights um, so that they can go on to actually compute on the next uh, batch of data. And so one of the things that we look in these kinds of uh, uh, communication calls is how long is this uh, communication call, how much data is being transferred. And we use that information to both build the system and deploy the appropriate networking necessary. So this is what determines actually do you want 100 gigabit, 200 gigabit, so on and so forth. And also how well is the framework um, that is either it's PyTorch, uh, TensorFlow and so on, how well is it actually performing in being able to efficiently overlap both the computation and communication, because these uh, accelerators are powerful. They can do both at the same time. 
but it's really important that the software framework that you pick can also leverage that capability very efficiently. So that's how the DDP uh, model works. And at the end of that uh, computation and communication, you will update the weights and you go through a uh, loop again. And this, this iteration, um, uh, th this loop continues for thousands of times, basically, right? Hundreds of thousands of times. Uh, a second model we, we use actually uh, is called a fully shared data parallel model. So this is the model where once the, G when the model gets bigger and bigger, there is a point where they no longer fit in the GPU. It's not only just the model, but you also have a lot of intermediate data. So you need to leave some GPU memory space for this intermediate. That means the amount of model that you can fit in might be a factor of four or five smaller than the actual GPU memory. So once you, your model gets to tens of billions of parameters, it no longer fits in a single GPU. So you need to do uh, something called sharding. So this is where you actually keep different uh, shards of the model in different GPUs, but then you compose the model layers dynamically as, as you are doing the computations. So in the forward pass, you uh, gather the layers of uh, that you do not own in a single GPU and then you compute uh, the forward pass, but that gathering is called an all gather operation. So every GPU um, uh, runs this operation and, and you capture the uh, set of layers that are necessary to do that forward computation. And once you are done, you throw them away and then you get the next set of layers and, and so on and so forth. Um, and, and so that means the sequence of calls that, that will happen in that kind of step is called an all gather sequence. And these calls again have to be overlapped nicely with the compute so that you could keep the GPUs busy, but at the same time, you can uh, keep your networking uh, uh, used efficiently uh, to, to compute uh, on the GPUs. Once you're done with those forward passes, then you get into this backward um, pass of the computation. And this is where the communication gets a little bit more complicated. In addition to doing the all gather, because you do not have all of the uh, weights for that layer, you, once you update these weights, you also have to do a reduce scatter. So this is the operation where you are actually sending the weights that you updated, but you no longer are the owner to the respective shard that actually owns those weights. So these calls, again, have to be overlapped quite nicely with the computation uh, to ensure that you are actually, you're, you're able to use these uh, network and the compute resources very efficiently. And this operation complete, uh, continues many, many, many times. So when we look at the AI frameworks and tools, we not only look at you know, how well they're able to use the underlying infrastructure, but how mature are they in terms of being able to support these kinds of both smaller models and larger models that use you know, data parallel, um, uh, fully sharded ma uh, model parallel, and then there is other tensor parallel and many other uh, incarnations as well. And these all become really important as you consider you know, which framework and which set of tools uh, you want to standardize your um, whole AI stack on. In addition to this, um, there is, you know, while we talk a lot about training, but a lot of the training does not happen until you actually go pre-process your data. There is tokenization, there is a lot of other tasks that you would run. And having the right tools for that pre-processing is also critical. So we collaborate with Ray Community, Apache Ray is an open source project, uh, uh, and, and we collaborate with them. So uh, Ray enables you to basically run Python in a distribution, distributed fashion. So these pre-processing tools, uh, you can express these constructs very easily in Python, and then we run them on thousands of uh, CPUs and sometimes GPU and GPU combinations to pre-process the data and produce the tokenized data that then feeds into this kind of distributed training. And I'm showing here a, a blog we wrote with the PyTorch community on scaling PyTorch FSDP for training foundation models. And as a result, we are able to uh, not only uh, pre-process uh, and train and achieve really significant uh, scaling numbers. So what I'm showing on the graph here is as we are scaling our 11 billion uh, parameter model, uh, it's a T FSDP T5 model. As we are scaling it up, we're able to achieve close to ideal uh, performance. So this is as uh, this is the time per iteration, um, our training hours per epoch. Um, and so as you add more uh, accelerators, obviously you want to see a reduction in your training time. So these are some of the models that we we ourselves are training. Um, we we are. Uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, we are training a lot of models in time series, NLP, cybersecurity, uh, code, 
and, and, and many others. And this is the kind of infrastructure that we ourselves use uh, to train these models. And once the model training is complete, obviously, again, you need to be able to validate. Is the model produced anything that's of value or usefulness? <laughs> so there is a lot of validation that happens, and you will use a, a compute cycles uh, for that as well. And so by standardizing on an open shift uh, Kubernetes based uh, infrastructure, we are able to do the entire pipeline of pre-processing, training, validation, and further, uh, I didn't cover, but inferencing uh, all on a single uh, Kubernetes based platform. So with that, I think we are kind of uh, at the end of what we wanted to say. I will just quickly uh, summarize it. Uh, as Mulin mentioned, Mulin mentioned, you know, AI, Workload compute requirements are certainly doubling every 10 months. From our perspective, it's actually faster than that. Um, and, and you are seeing AI adoption. Uh, this is going to accelerate and influence many, many uh, industries while the excitement is in uh, chat GPT and kind of cheating uh, in your school assignments. But we think actually business has a significant um, uh, business value from, from these kinds of models. But to uh, leverage these capabilities, you really need a scale out infrastructure. The, it's both cost flexible and cost effective. Um, we didn't spend a lot of time on the cost point, but these accelerators are quite expensive. So being able to keep them uh, used, occupied, and being able to use them efficiently is really critical to capitalize on this new technology. Uh, in addition to just the infrastructure, you need a unified cloud native platform that, that will enable you to seamlessly go from training to fine tuning to inference and go back to training in a, in a very um, uh, seamless fashion so that you can minimize that loop uh, of training and inference. Um, finally, technologies like Kubernetes, PyTorch, Ray, um, Mulin mentioned the Snap CSDK, these, and, and there are many more. These really enable AI developers to quickly leverage AI technologies in their applications without becoming experts at infrastructure, without becoming experts at the uh, cloud native stacks and so on. So it's really important to have a take a whole end-to-end um, uh, -end stack view and build these capabilities so that uh, your organizations can leverage uh, AI. So thank, thank you. Last one. Oh, yes. So thank you, Melinda and Silam, and thank you to our audience. We do have some questions. Uh, as a reminder, uh, you can ask questions by selecting the Ask Question option and entering your question. And we also want to make sure you know you can rate this presentation. Um, it's important to us as it gives us a solid indication of whether we're delivering the right quality of content. So one means you would have rather spent your time more wisely elsewhere, and five means it was perfect for you. And so jumping into the questions, there was one during the session earlier um, which was about what is GDR, which you mentioned in the context of using it with Rocky. Yeah. Yeah, so j j just to uh, explain GDR, GDR stands for GPU Direct RDMA. And so when you, when a GPU on a one node needs to communicate to a GPU on a, another node, the, there is at least three different ways of communicating. There is more, but three, there is a, a GPU can, uh, you can use TCP where GPU, data is copied back into the CPU, and then CPU of this node uh, orchestrate the communication of the CPU in another node. That obviously adds a, a lot of latency or going through the whole TCP protocol and so on. Um, another way to do is through Rocky or RDMA or converged Ethernet, or probably a lot of you are familiar with RDMA, where CPUs actually talk to each other through um, RDMA channels. So you set, uh, uh, you send and receive without the intervention of the CPU. Um, next level in that communication efficiency is GDR or GPU direct RDMA, where a GPU on one node can talk to a GPU on another node directly without completely bypassing the CPU. And this is done through the uh, network interfaces that I showed in uh, one of the slides. So I can go back, but basically GPU is talking to each other directly, bypassing all of the um, PCI links and the uh, CPU. Hope that answers. Thanks. Thank you. And another question for both or either of you is, where do you think most of the AI will run, especially training? Will it be in the public cloud or will it be in on be in on prem on premises or both? Um, do you I, want to take that first? Yeah, I would. I would probably say that it's going to be a mix. Uh, there are advantages to the public cloud, um, uh, uh, especially because it's pay as you go. So when uh, experimenting with new models, new innovations, new uses of AI, 
uh, and when scaling, uh, public cloud uh, deployments make a lot of sense. Uh, but there are still um, a lot of data privacy concerns. There are increasing numbers of regulations about where data needs to reside physically and uh, which geographies. And so uh, largely because of that, um, uh, many organizations are, are uh, deciding to build out their own data centers. And uh, once they have a proven large scale training or inference uh, regime in place, uh, they often find it just plain cost effective uh, to migrate their cl public cloud deployment into a, into a data center that they control and that they can control the costs on. Okay. Yeah, I, 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 I concur with Milan. Um, we are seeing a, a pattern of, you know, dual approach, right? There is some small companies that are, you know, that don't have the right capital necessary, not the uh, expertise and teams necessary to, to get these kinds of uh, uh, servers and deploy them themselves. They are adopting increasingly public cloud. Uh, and we are seeing some uh, decent sized companies actually adopt that approach as well. Uh, keep in mind these GPU servers tend to be very power hungry. And so you need you need the right you know, uh, floor plan, power, cooling, uh, so on and so forth. So public cloud definitely becomes kind of a, uh, a place where you have easy access and you only pay for what you consume. But we are also seeing uh, trends where certain amount of certain data and certain organizations have constraints on their ability to you know get their data out uh, from their um, uh, walls so in those scenarios we we are definitely seeing uh, customers deploy uh, these systems uh, on premise as well so I, I don't think it's going to be one or the other which going to be a combination of both but by adopting more of a common i think platform technology it will unify that uh, usage model in public cloud and on-prem Perfect. And another question is, is GDR more efficient than NVLink? Um, yeah, so just keep in mind, uh, at least until recently, NVLink and NVSwitch is limited to a single node. And when you have to go cross node, you need to go over the network. And that uh, GPU direct RDMA is one mechanism to go over the network. Now, NVIDIA with the Hopper H100, they also introduced this NVSwitch technology that goes cross node as well. Uh, but um, the scale of that is, I think, uh, uh, somewhat limited. So if you are deploying large scale, uh, you will use a combination of NVLink within the node and uh, GPU direct RDMA across nodes. In terms of efficiency, it comes down to how many network interfaces you plug into the system. <laughs> NVLink on a A100 system is a 400, uh, 600 gigabytes uh, per second. So if you put enough uh, network uh, cards in a system, you, you could get close to NVLink bandwidth. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, and, and there is some latency issues as well uh, that play in. NVLink obviously is, is better, uh, but it's limited in scale, whereas G, you know, GDR is more broadly uh, deployable at a larger scale. Uh, but you will pay for the latency. OK. And another question is, if you are talking about Rocky, do you mean always Rocky V2? That is correct. I'm talking only about Rocky V2. Thank you for the clarification. Yes. <laughs> and then another one is, can you comment on storage needs for DL training? And have you considered the use of scale out cloud storage services for deep learning training? What are the challenges and issues for this? Um, I'll, I'll start on this one. Um, uh, the, the storage needs are number one, massive. Uh, number two, based on the kind of training that you're doing, uh, data parallel versus model parallel and uh, different optimizations, you will need data to be, uh, you will need parts of your data to be local in, in many circumstances. So it's not entirely possible to uh, do efficient training when data is uh, physically remote and and uh, there's a large latency in accessing it. So some sort of uh, at least a caching infrastructure will be required in order for your training to pr 
pr uh, to proceed um, efficiently. Um, I don't know, Selim, do you have any other thoughts on scale out approaches for, for training data? Yeah, I, I absolutely, you know, 100% agree. Um, there is, unfortunately, there is no silver bullet for uh, addressing the data problem with large scale uh, training. Um, we take a kind of a three pronged approach. Um, predominantly, we uh, recommend users to put their data in object storage, and that becomes kind of the source of all data, and that's actually where the data lives, right? And then we, um, many training jobs, um, especially training jobs that uh, deal with text data, don't tend to be huge in size because these are all characters, right? So we use object storage as actually a, um, as a source directly to read the data and feed the GPUs to train. So that's one model of training, but that's only works for really relatively smaller data sets and uh, even data sets that actually many times they get cached once you access the first time uh, because you, sh you shot it uh, quite nicely. So you don't have to go back to the data source many, many, many times as you're going through this uh, pass. There are uh, other data sets where the data volume is larger. So if you're dealing with pictures, if you're dealing with video, these kinds of training domains, we adopt a uh, two-pronged approach. In, in one scenario, we actually have a distributed um, cache, distributed file system kind of a, a cache mechanism where the end users actually have a copy of the data in this file system, and that becomes the source for uh, AI training. And in another scenario, uh, I, as I mentioned in the Vela system, we actually deployed that system with sufficient enough local storage. So we um, ask users to actually copy the data into that local storage or use that local storage as a, as a totally a, as a local cache. So as the AI training is actually continuing, once the data is accessed, it's actually cached on the local drive. And so subsequent iterations of that data um, basically comes from that cache. Uh, and, and this is much bigger than the local memory. Um, as I just mentioned, it's about 12 terabytes of cache. Uh, local storage is what we deploy with the 1.5 terabytes of DRAM. So we could get to these data sets that are in the 10 uh, terabyte range um, per node, right? Just from the local storage. And if they exceed that, then we go to this distributed cache. And if the data sets are small enough, then we just use object storage. So I think it's a at least a three different ways, uh, depending on the use case and the model you're trying to train. Uh, that you would adopt. Okay. okay. And another question is about um, the, the fully sharded stuff. So in a fully sharded data parallel model, there are three communication calls when compared to DDP. Does that mean it needs about three times more bandwidth? Um, um, not necessarily three times more bandwidth, um, but you will use the network a lot more uh, than what you would use in a DDP. In a DDP or distributed data parallel model, you will not use the network at all in the forward pass. So as the application is, uh, you're computing the forward pass, the network is idle, essentially, right? Whereas in an FSDP model, you use the network both in forward pass and in backward pass. So in that sense, you use the network more. <laughs> um, but uh, at the same time, because you are you don't have parts of the model within uh, your system, you need to get the model from the other neighbors. And so that means you will be using more bandwidth as well. I cannot give you the 3x number. I haven't seen the 3x, but it's 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 uh, it's more than DDP for sure. and and network is used longer than than DDP. Okay. And if using smart NIC instead of regular NIC, will it bring down latency on GDR communications? Um, this is an area actually we are trying to study at this point. And if there is interest, I'll be happy to chat with you more. Um, I have to imagine there is a way to make GDR communication more efficient by using smart NIC. Um, but I, I don't know exactly how. I mean, uh, I have some ideas on, you know, maybe running some collective operations on the smart NIC. So you don't even need to get up to the GPU, right? But uh, we haven't implemented any of this. And we, this is an area we are studying at this point. And then Thank one you for the question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's it. 
And then one possibly final question, uh, depending on if anything else comes in, is do you recommend using Optane persistent memory for AI or ML? Yeah, um, this uh, this is a good question. I, I think um, at the end of the day, depending on your data uh, uh, locality and latency needs, uh, yes, something like Optane persistent memory may be uh, may be very, very valuable. Um, it's uh, it's a matter of measuring uh, the latency needs uh, and uh, uh, from for accessing data from different locations um, and uh, and seeing where that fits in your overall infrastructure. Great. Yep. Then, oh. <laughs> so if there are no if there are not any other questions, which I don't see any, then I'd love to uh, thank our speakers again, Silam and Melinda. This was an excellent session. And thank you very much to our audience for joining us today. And don't forget, you can go out and rate our session. Um, thank you and see you next time. Thanks a lot.